Are you one of those people who love instruction manuals? My father-in-law was. He would pour over the manual for any item he bought because he wanted to know exactly how it worked, all the things it could do, and what problems and solutions to expect. But kids don't come with instruction manuals, so we all step into parenting a little blindly. It's kind of a figure it out as you go kind of a proposition from the start. When you send your little five-year-olds off to kindergarten and you imagine their school years ahead, you probably pictured happy children who love school and have friends and learn easily and make good grades and accomplish good things. If it doesn't turn out this way, if they begin to struggle or feel dumb or fight or cry over homework, you may like many parents, feel lost and confused. Now what? There's no instruction manual to tell you what to do. Well, today we're going to give you five steps for empowering your struggling or reluctant learner. This is LD Expert Live. I think many parents and teachers wish they had an instruction manual about now for motivating, supporting, and empowering their students. We feel guilty when our kids face difficulties and we don't know exactly how to help or protect them. Today, we want you to go away feeling empowered yourself. We're going to talk about some positive ways to understand and support children and teens who, for whatever reason, are having a tougher time than expected in school. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will help you understand why some bright kids have difficulty in school. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. I want to give a shout out to all of our faithful viewers and subscribers who join us every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Thank you for that. And let's say hello to Lauren. Hello. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Let us know who's here and where you're checking in from. We already have some people uh, checking in. We have Mona from Features Academy. We love partnering with them. She's here. Candice from Fusion Pasadena. She's here. Hi, Candice. And of course, Karen checking in from Sacramento. Hi, Karen. So let us know that you're here checking in. Oh, got one. Oh, I think she wins from being furthest away. Barbara from Miami, Florida. Okay, great to have you, Barbara. Um, let us know that you're here. Say hi, where you're checking in from. Um, don't forget about our mom squad. That is our private Facebook group. We can continue the conversation uh, by asking questions and commenting on the show. Uh, mom squad is a great resource for parents. Uh, just to get questions answered and to support each other. And I am happy to announce that starting in January, 2021, we're gonna resume our peace meetings in Mom Squad. So peace is a great resource for parents. We used to hold in-person peace meetings at all of our centers, at all four of our centers um, pre-COVID. Now we're going virtual. Peace stands for Parent Enrichment and Continued Education. Um, and it's a support group for you. It's a little bit different format than LD Expert Live. It's really a discussion. So we're gonna be holding it um, kind of via Zoom so that you can participate, ask questions. It's more conversational. We do talk about content and we go through Jill's book, um, but it's really education and support for parents. So stay tuned for announcements of that. We're gonna run it through Mom Squad. So that's so join mom squad if you want to um, be on that list to get notifications about that meeting uh, we hold it once a month and go through a variety of topics that relate to learning and attention issues so looking forward to starting that up again soon a lot of parents really appreciated peace uh, when we we used to hold it so um, and then i'm really excited for today's 
topic and guest. I, as a parent myself, you know, I'm just starting this journey. My daughter is five and she just started TK and so far she loves it. Um, she loves school and so um, we're hoping that continues, but I do, I'm hearing from a lot of parents that um, school isn't going so well, especially this year with COVID. Um, so I know a lot of you might have questions or comments, so start posting and we'll ch check back in with you in a bit, okay? Thank you, Lauren. We will check back in with you and our viewers in a little bit to uh, answer your questions and, and talk about your comments. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. Our guest today is Danny Rickman, the head of school at Fusion Academy in Pasadena, California. Danny's passion for education began when she was running a music program at a small studio and eventually led to a master's degree from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Danny has been an educational leader for over 15 years and has dedicated nine of those to Fusion Academy as head of school at three different campuses across the nation. As the parent of two beautiful girls aged seven and 10, one of whom struggles to navigate school with a unique set of learning needs, Danny has become as passionate about supporting parents as she is about supporting students. Danny was drawn to Fusion due to the immense alignment she felt with the core values that are the foundation supporting F Fusion student success, including love, passion, communication, advocacy, authenticity, fun, celebration, and community. Welcome, Danny. Hello, thank you so much for having me this morning. Oh, it's so fun to have you. You are the head of school at Fusion Academy Pasadena, and I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about Fusion. Yeah, absolutely. So Fusion is a small private school and all education is one-to-one. -one. So a student's entire academic experience is very personalized and we have the opportunity to use relationship-based learning to help students with intrinsic motivation, even in areas that are a challenge and help them recognize their strengths and their abilities. And then there's a huge social component as well with our homework cafe. Our idea is that we're going to keep homework at school so that parents don't have to fight that battle. And then in our homework cafe, our students also have the opportunity to um, hang out, play cards, uh, get to know each other, make connections based on who they are and, and what's important to them, what their interests are, rather than just what class they're in or what grade they're in. And there are clubs and fun nights and student meetings, and it's just so much fun. Our goal is that students, when they come to school at Fusion, they're having a fun experience that allows them to become lifelong learners and help support their success for the future. Well, there is a fusion. There is a fusion academy in most of the communities where our learning centers are, and we just love partnering with them. Great philosophy and atmosphere, and and just a really good place for students. You know, you talked about that really important social aspect at Fusion. I'll bet that's a little bit challenging now with everything being virtual? Sure. It, it, I mean, it, it definitely is a unique challenge, although students are quite well versed when it comes to utilizing technology to connect. So <laughs> our homework cafe is still open and our students come in and play games together and hang out. And we do our best to keep the students feeling connected, even though it's not the same as being in person. It never is. Um, and we can't wait to be able to be in person again. But, um, but for the meantime, our students are still coming to meetings and sharing. Our student ambassador group is still working and doing volunteer work. And our senior cohort is still you know, meeting regularly and making sure that they're ready for what comes after high school. And so we're, I, I think we're pretty lucky we were set up in a way that really allowed us to continue the majority of our programming like normal, just virtually, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is that is great because that, you know, I think 
that's a big concern parents have right now is that social piece, especially for their teenagers. And, um, you know, this is, this is how life is right now and for a while. So, you know, I think finding creative ways to just continue to connect, however that looks, you know, is fantastic. So as, as a school administrator, what is your biggest worry for students right now? Oh my goodness. Well, I, you know, I, I think that it might be expected that my answer is going to be learning loss or focused around the academic side of things. But, but truly, I think my biggest concern right now really is just students feeling that they're connected to people outside of their home and that they are still actually engaged in their learning experience and their social experiences because the more disconnected our students are feeling, the less likely they are to continue to enjoy learning and to, and to feel supported by the people outside of their home. And that is just so critical to being successful in school, to being well, um, mentally, physically, and otherwise. And so right now, my my biggest concern is just wellness overall, um, because there's always an option with regards to their academics. but but really, truly, they need to be well to be able to show up for that. And I do, that's my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm hearing that from every professionals everywhere, it seems, you know, the classroom is a really natural opportunity for growth for kids that, that they're kind of missing right now, you know? Um, And, and I think it's a little mixed up for parents, not being sure where they fit into that picture. I I think that's, I mean, I can speak from my own personal experience with my daughters. I don't really know what my role is right now. I I am not the teacher. I am supposed to be supporting the classroom, but I'm also working. And so I don't know everything that's necessarily going on. And um, I think I, for me, I know that that is the most challenging part, just knowing what is my role right now and how do I best support my child to ensure that she's getting, that both of them are getting the most they can out of their educational experience. So, you know, it it's really interesting. We can you know, professionally be doing one thing. And then personally, as a parent, you know, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to figure out. But, but from the standpoint of, of a school administrator, of an educator, do you have any advice for parents in terms of their role? And that, that whole issue of, do I intervene? Do I not? You know, if my child is interrupting or. Oh my gosh. Yes. I think parenting comes with so much, so much, I think, shame um, that we place on ourselves as we watch our children interact with the world and feeling like that is a reflection of our parenting somehow. And we've never really had to kind of glimpse into the classroom and how who our child is when they're in the classroom the way that we do now that we are home watching them and so i have to say there are moments when i all i want to do is go in and tell my daughter oh my gosh please you know <laughs> to stop interrupting the teacher or pay attention that's disrespectful but i have to remember too that the teachers in that classroom are that's what they're dealing with all the time, typically with our kids, whether I'm there or not. And they really are charged with supporting our children in that kind of growth. And so I have to constantly step back and and check myself, I know, and and remember that the teacher really, this is this is their role, is to help our children learn their place within the classroom and how to navigate that socially and otherwise. So I think my my biggest challenge I know has been be quiet, Danny. <laughs> this isn't your job right now. This is the job of those teachers. And your job is to make sure that your child shows up 
and is okay emotionally and otherwise and is doing their work as best we can outside of the classroom and that they know that my child knows that I'm here for them. But I, I think that it really is challenging because everyone's home situation is so different right now as well. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I feel very lucky to be able to work from home right now because I do have the ability to, in between meetings, step in and support in some way. But obviously, that's also a challenge. But then there are many parents out there that are not able to be even in the same space as their child as they're navigating this. And I think there, it, it's hard to have one piece of advice for everyone, given how unique everyone's situations are. But I think that the biggest piece is making sure that our, our children are enjoying school still, because I know one of my biggest fears also for my own child and for other students out there is that during this time, they become so disengaged that they lose that spark or that love for learning that is mm -hmm. so critical to just getting them to school because that's sometimes half the battle and, and wanting just to figure out where do I push and where do I pull back here to ensure that my child is not starting to hate school or resent school in some way because of their experience. And so I think that tends to be my biggest focus and what I tend to also tell parents is, you know, let's let's focus on helping our kids find still the joy in learning and, and engage in the classroom best we can as opposed to fighting other battles right now. Right. You know, there's just there's just so much going on right now that's, you know, <laughs> new territory for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, all of that can impact a student's motivation and engagement in school. So I know, um, you know, engagement is is a huge piece of what's happening at Fusion what would you say is the first step in empowering students, particularly our reluctant or struggling students? So yeah, I, I think the first step really for me lies in the mentorship and the relationships. So I studied education in graduate school, but my focus was on at-risk youth and prevention. And when you study risk and resiliency in, in students, everything that comes up, it, it all boils down to one thing. It, it takes one person. And often that's not someone within your home. So the parent-child relationship is, is very different um, with regards to what, what needs are met there. But really it just takes one person believing in a student and connecting with a student in a way where they feel seen and heard and cared about in the classroom and in life in general. And, and so really, I think the first step is ensuring that a student does have a connection with someone. And if it's not within their school and in their classroom, it can be extended family, um, family friends, but finding that one person outside of the, the main um, hub at home that is providing some support and care for a student and helping them feel like they matter somewhere and and that and and that what they know and what they're capable of and what their strengths are are important and recognized somewhere. And I really think that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And that <clears throat> could be a, a teacher or a coach or you know, absolutely, absolutely. A, a relative. I, I know distance learning is really hard on teachers as well as students, but taking the time to make a personal connection can make a huge difference. I know we have a, a high school teacher who lives across the street from us and he's very worried about his students and their mental health. And he takes time to call them and just talk to them outside of school to try to make that connection. And, and I know you were sharing with me about how your daughter's teacher was able to do that. Can yeah, you? My, yeah, my, my older daughter who's in fourth grade right now, she's, um, her teacher is phenomenal. Um, none of these teachers obviously were prepared to do an entire year's worth of curriculum online. Um, and I'm, I'm really impressed with how well she's managing everything considering. And 
one of the things that she really does is she knows that my daughter does struggle, um, especially with engagement. And she goes out of her way to make sure when she says the role in the morning that she notes something about my daughter, like, oh, I love your smile this morning or um, or call separately. Sometimes she'll call and if I'm unable to answer, she'll leave a message so that she knows for sure that my daughter is able to hear a message from her. And I can't tell you how much that changes things for my daughter. She just lights up. Because when you are, when there's 25 little boxes on a screen and you're one of those 25 boxes, it's really hard to feel seen and to feel like you matter in that space, even if your teacher absolutely does care and, and absolutely does feel that you matter. There's just not enough space within a Zoom classroom to be able, with 25 students, to be able to reach all of those students and help them feel that way. So she really has gone above and beyond and that has made a huge difference for my daughter. In fact, when school's in session, our biggest issue is getting her to school and she doesn't miss days since we've been virtual. And I think that is because of her teacher, because she wants to show up for her teacher and she knows her teacher cares about her. You know, that that is huge you know that motivation to show up for uh you know for the teacher uh, i mean we experience the same thing jill i'm sure your staff want to show up because of you right we as adults if we have a boss that believes in us and is is caring for us what we're able to accomplish and what we will show up for and how we will show up will be significantly different than if we don't have that support or or that guidance sometimes too. And so I think it's it's not just a student issue. It's it's across the board. We all need to feel important and like we matter and connected. And it's particularly challenging for teachers to be able to do that in the virtual realm, but some teachers are doing an amazing job. My daughter's teacher, one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and especially right now, it's really easy to focus on the frustrating and negative things and and correcting, you know, your kids if they're not focused on the screen 100 percent or whatever. And and so just even noticing those little things, parents or teachers um, for each other, for their kids, the positive things, you know, makes a real difference. No doubt. Yeah, you and know, our brains are hardwired to focus towards that negative piece. And then when it's in front of us all day long with our kids, it's really hard sometimes to de balancing our own stress and watching our child maybe struggle or not do what we would hope they would do in the classroom. And mm -hmm. and so it, it's it, it really is challenging sometimes to see the positive in a situation that does feel pretty dire at times and, and unpredictable and, and there's so much unknown. Um, so I think that, that that's one of the challenges for parents too, is to find where are these positive moments, where are these things that I can reinforce that that are positive for my child. I'm sorry, right. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, I, I was actually heading down that same road. You know, students who aren't experiencing success at school you know, they often look lazy or unmotivated, but it's not a lack of desire to do well. It's really more of a belief that no matter what they do, there's no payoff. They're not going to get good grades. They're not going to make their parents proud. So it, it kind of goes along with that. But thinking specifically about those kids who are really struggling, how do your teachers help students to get past that? past that belief that they're not going to be able to do it? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think, you know, I love the word lazy because it's um, <laughs> when I'm talking about the brain being hardwired, one of the things the brain is hardwired for is productivity. Our, our students and humans in general, they want to be um, successful and, and, and actually involved in something and producing something. But when it does feel like there's a roadblock for a student or for anyone and you can't name that roadblock or aren't getting the support and your needs aren't being met, 
you know, just as you said, Joe, what starts to happen is that a student sees that no matter how hard they try, no matter what they do, that they're still having the same results. And it feels pretty frustrating and demoralizing and, and disempowering. And so students really, you know, why would you continue to put yourself out there and, and feel like you're just constantly failing and being judged and whatever else might be going on in a student's personal narrative. And mm -hmm. so when, when I first meet with students, even prior to coming to our school, the first thing I really try to do is unpack that personal narrative. Students have so many beliefs about themselves and about what, what success looks like that are not serving them and that are not really based necessarily in reality. And, and they're taking cues that you know, of a teacher's frustration and internalizing it as they're frustrated with me and therefore I'm a problem. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the first thing that really happens for any student that is struggling is utilizing the relationship in the classroom to be able to look at that self-narrative and, and see where we maybe need to shift the mindset a little bit of a student and help them see themselves differently. And also a huge part of what we do at Fusion is help parents see their child differently. If you're used to constantly only getting contacted because there's some sort of challenge academically, behaviorally, whatever the issue might be, you also begin to create a narrative about yourself as a parent and right. your child and their future and what that means. And so a lot of times there's just a healing process that really needs to happen and, and an unpacking of really all of those negative beliefs that, um, that really need to be reframed. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes kids who start with us at the Learning Center are so discouraged. They feel like they've tried everything and nothing works. And so in those first few weeks, it really is the relationship with the instructor that keeps the student coming. And then, you know, if we can help kids see just the little wins, you know, um, then they start engaging because they're beginning to believe that maybe they could be successful. So our first step in empowering reluctant learners is building a relationship. And the second is that success breeds success. So as parents and teachers, we really wanna be looking for those little wins and just validate and celebrate the small steps that students are making. I think that's always important, um, but but especially now, it's probably especially important. You sure. know, students who have traditionally struggled often don't believe you if you give them generic praise, like, good job, awesome. So what we want to do is we want to give very specific praise so that students can recognize the wins. You kept this problem, you kept at this problem, even though it was hard, you never gave up. Or you finished this whole math page without getting distracted even one time. So we're just being very specific with our praise. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think especially because in, in the virtual realm, executive functioning is um, a challenge because we're working out of a different space. So any of the tools and skills we had had in place previously might might be a struggle at that time. And I think that really helping students be able to bite small pieces at a time, both with mm -hmm. you know with regards to success and and also with regards to the work. Is, is so important because a lot of students shut down just because of the overwhelm of that big picture. And if we can them and help it be manageable and help them feel like they are recognizing those small successes, um, it really does, as you say, breed success. I mean, I think that's incredibly important. Absolutely. The, the third step to empowering reluctant learners is to build the skills needed to do the job. And I know that looks a little bit different at the Learning Center than it does at school. Um, at, at the Learning Center, we think about learning kind of like a ladder that, and that uh, 
builds with school skills, academic skills up at the top, and then whole sets of other skills, underlying skills that are needed in order to learn those academic skills at the top. So the underlying skills are skills like attention, memory, auditory and visual processing, language processing, processing speed, and many others that aren't really taught. They're generally just assumed. But if any of those skills are weak or inefficient, it can cause even really bright students to have a tougher time in school than expected. So at Stowell Learning Centers, our goal is to identify and develop any of those underlying skills that aren't working for the student as well as they could be, and then remediate the reading, writing, spelling, or math. Giving students the tools they need to do the job is really critical. So there are also school skills that need to be built. Danny, as students begin to engage and believe in themselves a little bit more, what are some of the skills that your teachers try to help them develop so that they can feel more in control and independent? Yeah, uh, great question. And and by the way, all of the amazing work that you do at the Soul Center is, is why I love partnering with you as well, because we are not a special education program. And though we're great at being able to teach certain foundational skills and then be able to also take skills that a student has learned somewhere else and continue the growth with mm -hmm. regards to those. Our, our partnership with with Stoll and, and other learning centers are so important to being able to support the overall student success. So I'm really grateful for the work that you all do. And I, I just want to when it comes to skills, there are a lot of skills that we work on, for example, things like executive functioning skills, helping students be able to navigate within in their independent work, um, where they do their work and, and how to um, how to manage that work. And then also the social skills. There's so many um, test taking skills, all of those things. But really, I feel like before we even get into building those skills or building on those skills, I think what happens first is being able to create a safe space in the classroom where the student feels comfortable enough to be vulnerable so that mm -hmm. they can the risks that are needed to be taken to learn. So we don't go into school because we know everything. We go into school to learn these things. Um, although you'd be surprised how many students I ask, what does a successful learner look like or what a, su a successful student looks like? And they say it's someone who can do it on their own, who can learn things on their own. And I'm always it's always a fun conversation to unpack that with a student and help them realize, no, it's not about being able to do it on your own. It's about being able to be vulnerable enough to take the necessary risks to learn what you need to learn. And I think a lot of students have had experiences where that doesn't work out real well in the classroom for them. You know, they whether it has to do with the social environment or or the teacher not um, not recognizing and reinforcing some of the risks that are needed to be taken during that time or shaming a student. Most of the time, that's not even on purpose. It's as they're trying to classroom manage sometimes a message that is not really intended to be given will be taken by a sensitive student who is afraid to take those risks. So I think before we even get to that skill building, it's first creating the, the skill of being able to come into the classroom authentically and ask questions and not be afraid to make a mistake because that's how we learn. And then from there, we can move into things like executive functioning skills and test taking skills and study skills. But I think that's really where it starts. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Danny. Let's check in with Lauren and our viewers, see what's happening there. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like we have someone else checking in from Florida. Hi, Marla from Florida. So Florida representing today this morning. <laughs> Um, and Ronke checking in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Ronke, you'll be um, amused that we were we were lamenting that it was cold outside today. It was 40 <laughs> degrees this morning. And so she probably has no sympathy for us there in Michigan. <laughs> um, and it looks like, um, go Danny, go, says Jackie. You have your own hype squad joining us this morning. 
<laughs> love to hear from you. Um, we have Sharon checking in. Hi, Sharon. Um, and then um, Carolyn um, is agreeing with all of this. Very important, specific praise and careful timing. Thank you. Sing Strides is super realistic. This is Carolyn, Dottie White's daughter. And I believe Dottie White was a parent of a student, Jill, that you had a long time ago. Derek, yes. Does that sound familiar? Ab oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, she was also a clinician at our center oh. after she she just did such amazing work with her son that she uh, worked for us for a little while until awesome. she moved. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so it's great when you see changes, I mean, in your child, I mean, that's, that's infectious. Um, and then we have a, we do have a question from Karen and I'll try to read it quickly and then take it down. So Karen's uh, checking in. She says her son with auditory processing disorder has been more successful this year with online learning. He says, because there's not a lot of distracting background noises, you know, so he can fully concentrate on the teacher, but her friend's son is overwhelmed because, and I, I'm hearing a lot of this, that, that the teacher presents all of the homework at once for the day or sometimes for the week. Um, and he he gets so overwhelmed, he becomes unglued, even though he's, he's totally capable of doing it. Do you have any ideas on how to prevent that kind of overwhelm um, initially? Because sometimes that can send students into shutdown mode. Yeah. Well, it, Danny talked about this, about breaking things into bite-sized pieces. And I think maybe one of the things we want to do is prepare the student ahead of time and and say, okay, you know, your teacher's going to give you all of your assignments for the week and it's going to feel like a lot, but let's just make up an appointment together at four o'clock today. And what we're going to do is together, we're just going to break this down into little chunks so you can just do one at a time, maybe pre preparing in advance and then you know, um, so that so that they can kind of say to themselves, okay, it's a lot, but I don't have to worry about it because we're going to break it down. Yeah. So preparing ahead of time, absolutely. And letting them know that it's going to look like a lot, but I'm, I'm with you. So again, going back to that maybe relationship with the parent, like I'm on your side and I'm going to help you through this. But great suggestions. Um, we have another question from someone in our mom squad. Uh, Facebook group that PM'd me a question just asking about her son that does have a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, he's struggling with online classes, just not being able to focus and constantly trying to, I guess, multitask. He says he can he can do multiple things at once. And no, <laughs> he, he really can't, you know, toggling back and forth between like websites or games. He's not really focused. Any suggestions for helping him stay engaged with his online classes? I know this uh, this scenario quite well as mm -hmm. it is one of the things that um, that my daughter struggles with, and I. So obviously, one thing is to really look at the technology that they're using for the class to see if there are limits that can be put on what they can access during that time, but outside of that. The, the truth is, is that our kids are growing up in in a world that we don't 100 percent understand. I don't know what a world without social media looks like. I don't know what uh, or I know, but our kids do not know. Sorry, forgive me, uh, but should have had a little more uh, coffee this morning. But uh, <laughs> but, you know, I know what that looks like. Our kids do not know what that looks like. And, and they are quite skilled at being able to toggle back and forth when it comes to technology. So the first thing that I always encourage parents to do is before getting upset about that, first really looking at the situation and really talking to your child about whether or not they really are disengaged or whether part of what they're doing is 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 trying to stay engaged in a format where it really is not ideal maybe for their learning and i think we're very quick to say no that's wrong to students instead of stopping and asking what's going on you know what what are you looking at because it may be that some of the things that they're doing are actually supporting the learning um i know that i got in trouble a lot in school oh uh oh 
Did what she... did you get in trouble for? Oh, oh hi. <laughs> you I, cut I, out. I, I wanted I, to go. That was on purpose. I was trying to create yeah. some suspense. No, but <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I got in trouble because I doodled a lot when I was mm -hmm. in school. Because when it came to auditory information, I could not just process someone talking to me and get all of that information. But if I was engaging in something physically as well, you know, doodling. Today, I'm on actually a yoga ball chair that helps me quite a bit too, you know, and this is as an adult, you know, then I was able to really truly grasp the information. So I always encourage educators and parents to really ask the child first, because a lot of times if a child recognizes on their own that something is getting in their way, they might actually make some adjustments. However, if they're told something is getting in their way without being part of that conversation, they might resist. And mm -hmm. so I think opportunities for a conversation to ensure that we're actually seeing that interaction appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That is, that is huge. I, I just think that's incredible advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and we've seen, you know, in our in our sessions or just helping support our, our parents and our students with online learning. Yes, having something that is appropriate to maybe fidget with or, you know, that, that the yoga ball, we've seen plenty of, of students in our own sessions sitting on yoga balls, and it's, it's fine. Yeah, they might be bouncing around a little bit, but they're with us, they're engaged. Um, you know, anything like that, that um, a parent can utilize that it's not too distracting or if they do have their mic or and their camera on it's not going to make too much noise but that can help a student be able to kind of harness some of that energy um, a little bit to stay engaged yeah um, we had dr weichman was on a previous show and he talked about for kids that do try to toggle and are playing games and they're supposed to be online learning he suggested projecting the screen having you know the student sit out in a in like the living room and then projecting the screen out in the living room so parents can make sure that their kids are on the right website um, that they're supposed to be on. So that was also good advice. Um, Kathy is is just agreeing. She used to doodle too. She couldn't, um, you know, when she couldn't understand auditorily the information uh, presented, she couldn't cope with that. So doodling helped her as well. So that's a really great um, kind of coping strategy. Thank you. Um, so you know, we'll check in one more time um, in a little bit, but keep posting if you have questions or comments. Um, we'll we'll try to get to them in the show. So thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Lauren. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. And my guest today is Danny Rickman, the head of school for Fusion Academy in Pasadena, California. We're talking about empowering reluctant learners. You know, when students struggle with some aspect of learning, they often develop coping strategies. And as they begin to develop the skills they need to do the job, we might have to help them let go of those coping strategies that are no longer needed. I remember we were working with a 10-year-old girl named Serena. We were working on reading phrases and she was going along well and then all of a sudden, her face just crumpled up and her eyes got all teary and she began to breathe really quick, shallow breaths. And that became a full blown stress reaction. Well, just as quickly when we distracted her from the task, Serena recovered and became her friendly, precocious self and she was able to continue the task. But then the pattern repeated itself. Well, what was happening was Serena was defaulting to an old coping strategy, one that had served her to get her out of reading and spelling in the past, but she didn't need that anymore as her skills grew. When smart kids struggle in school, it's frustrating and it's embarrassing for them. They often subconsciously develop coping strategies to get away from a really uncomfortable task or to cover the fact that they can't do the work. So that might look like being the class clown because, hey, you know, if I'm funny, maybe no one will notice that I can't do the work. Or flying under the radar by being really sweet and quiet and helpful because 
if I'm sweet and helpful, maybe you'll sit with me so I don't have to struggle through this alone. Or being belligerent or aggressive because getting into trouble is better than everybody thinking I'm dumb. Well, in Serena's case, it was falling into extreme anxiety. This was a real and frightening reaction. And her parents and teachers realized that in that anxious state, she wasn't going to learn anything. So tasks were often changed or eliminated or postponed. When students have coping strategies, it's because they serve them in some way. They need them in order to manage. But as their skills develop and they have the tools to do the job, those leftover coping strategies just get in their way. And we may have to help them see that they've got this. They don't need those behaviors anymore. I'm, I'm sure when students start at Fusion, you see a lot of that, a lot of coping strategies, because for some of your students, traditional school just hasn't worked. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's where that relationship comes in, because sometimes in the very beginning of class, it, we really are spending more time addressing just the emotional needs of the student before we can even get to the learning and and the more we continue to unpack what those what those challenges are or their beliefs are and also the behaviors associated with place right and and be able to have a conversation with the students about it because we underestimate kids way too often and they you know if we let them in on the conversation both in as what as to what we're seeing with them but also being vulnerable enough to model how we manage and what we do when we make mistakes um, our students are able to to hear that and and learn from that in a whole different way yeah, I, I think that that kind of collaboration and connection is critical. And truly, uh, until we can work through some of the emotional blocks, kids aren't really available for learning. So, Absolutely. Uh, so uh, going back to that, that idea of coping, I mean, they come in with those strategies and they need them to protect themselves. And so, you know, step four of empowering reluctant learners is helping them be aware of and let go of old coping strategies, you know, kind of validating, you know what, you needed that when you before because reading was so difficult or whatever it is, but you don't need that anymore. So we can let that go. And so sort of giving them, um, you know, permission. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of conversations that we have with students around that. But I, I do think also when you remove a student from the environment that was causing the need for a lot of those um, coping strategies, and now they're in a classroom and it's just them and their teacher, it, it sometimes, sometimes those things start to drop off naturally right. just because of the nature of our programming and how, how we do that. Um, and, and you can see, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen students come in just holding so much tension. And as soon as they start to realize that they're in a different environment and that we are not coming from a punitive place and that we are gonna recognize their strengths and we're gonna give them time to get where they need to be. It's just this, huh. I mean, you can yeah. literally yeah. see it. And, and it is, it's so wonderful because all of that that they've been holding is keeping them from moving forward academically too. Right, right. Well, you, you talked about this, you alluded to this a little bit, um, and I want you to talk about it a little bit more. Step five in empowering reluctant learners is finding a way to understand their world. That it, it really is challenging. Every time I think I have a grip on that, something happens that, that reminds me that I don't really understand 100% what our students today are going through. I think about graduation this past year where 
I had a bunch of very upset um, high school seniors that we were going to be having a virtual graduation. And, and I really struggled to understand that because I didn't, I, I'm not growing up in the time that they are. And I don't have right. those, those same concerns, nor did I have that same experience. We wouldn't have had the option for a virtual graduation <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if this had all happened when I was in school. But so I, I do think really trying to understand and listening more than we're talking. It's a really hard thing for, for adults, I think, in general, because we feel so much pressure to have the answers and to be the guides and to be the teacher and to be the parent, whatever our role might be. And, and the thing is, is that part of what our role is as adults in teaching students is to let them know that nobody knows everything. <laughs> we, you know, we all are, are learning together. And so I think that um, being able to really talk to a student about what their experience is and actually, um, my my daughter and I had an interesting experience recently where I've been really struggling. She also has quite a bit of anxiety. So talking about the things that cause anxiety causes more anxiety. So she'd rather not <laughs> talk about them. Um, so it can be really challenging to really know what's going on for her. And I know that's the case for many students. And so I, um, she asked me to play Would You Rather with her. Um, if any of you that are watching know that that game, you know, it's ultimately just to a question, would you rather do this or do that? You know, be president of the United States or be, you know, a, a successful CEO in a company. There's so many questions and they can get silly too. But um, she asked me to play a game with her and I sat down and I was playing Would You Rather. And I just found this amazing opportunity to really understand where she's coming from better and what really grabbed me was there was a question about, would you rather give a, give away social media or um, Netflix, I think was the question. And, and my daughter said, oh my gosh, Netflix, definitely. And I was baffled by that because I wouldn't give away the opportunity to see movies and things. I can still call my friends. I can still hang out with my friends. I don't have to have social media. But I realized she just looked at me in that moment. She says, mom, you just don't get it. You don't know you don't know what it's like to not have social media or you know what it's like to not have social media in your life and i don't and and i realized in that moment there's something i'm really missing here about my child's experience and therefore everything that i think i know and and all the advice and and words of wisdom that i think i'm giving her aren't always really coming from a place of honoring her actual experience. And mm -hmm. I have found that the Would You Rather game, if it, if any parents, if it helps you out, is really, really supportive to getting a student to, or in a child in general, to feel like they can share their opinion without it being judged. And you're sharing yours as well. So it, and then it really invites some dialogue that might not happen otherwise. Right. You know, I when you were telling me about that, uh, I thought, oh, this is brilliant because it's non-threatening and and it's just it starts out as a game. But you never know what avenues of dialogue are going to then open up. So it doesn't feel like you're giving them advice or telling them what to do. It's just it's just a a conversation. So it's really creating an awareness and a space for kids and parents to talk to each other. You know, it's just amazing how how such a simple little thing can be, I think, such a brilliant tool. Absolutely. And and it's it, I think one of the really critical parts about it is you're explaining your why. We we go around telling students and children and our own children what to do often, but sometimes there's just not enough time even in the day to really explain the why around mm -hmm. everything. But when when you're playing would you rather so you have to explain why you would rather do this or why you would rather do that and and really living out loud, speaking all of the pieces of a thought process that that our kids don't always get to see of our own learning process. And, and so I think the more we can let children in general into our thought process and our struggles and, and how we see things, 
it allows them to get guidance without feeling like they are being guided. <laughs> right, right, which is which is very important. One of those things that needs to be in that parenting instruction manual. Oh, yes, indeed. It, because we know our kids will always do the opposite of what we ask them to do, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've been talking about empowering reluctant learners as a school administrator what would you want to say to empower parents right now? Oh, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you the amount of times I'm, I'm reminding myself and other parents, breathe, just definitely breathe. But I think what I mean by that is take, take a step back for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we put so much pressure on ourselves to be super mom or super dad. And, and now when we're managing work at home and our children's work at home, there is an even larger amount of pressure on us to be that superhero. And I think really what we all need to do is take a breath and step back and really look at the big picture. Our, is pushing homework this one particular night the, the battle we really want to fight? Or is there a bigger issue of my child is starting to dislike learning and and really stepping back and questioning those things and it is one of the most important pieces of advice if someone were asking that I would want to give them and that I am trying to take myself i it is very very challenging to just slow down a little bit and and ask the right questions of of our students and of ourselves and of our children mm -hmm. And um, and so I think that really is the most valuable piece of advice I can give right now, given that everybody's situation is so wildly different. Thank you so much for that. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell with our guest, Danny Rickman, the head of school for Fusion Academy in Pasadena, California. Let's check back in with Lauren and our viewers one more time before we wrap up. Hi, this is this is all really great advice. And I know parents really appreciate it because we are putting it on ourselves right now. I mean, we're trying to juggle everything, let alone our kids are trying to juggle everything with school and social relationships and just, you know, all our worlds are upside down. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, I have another question from that was sent to me in Mom Squad. This mom um, is talking about her daughter really losing motivation with just getting um, on logging on to her online classes. So, um, and the district's taking attendance. And so she's having, um, getting into battles with her, her daughter about just logging on. She doesn't want to turn on her camera. Teacher doesn't require that she turns on her camera. Daughter says it's a waste of time. She doesn't need to be there. She can do her work on her own. Um, and so she's just asking for some advice. How can I get her to basically show up? Um, because the school's getting on the parents now for truancy because they're taking attendance. Mm. That is a really, really tough one. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I, I think part of it is if, if there's an opportunity to engage the teacher and to be able to build that relationship that we're talking about, to have the student have some sort of motivation to show up for the teacher, even if they don't feel like it's showing up for themselves. Um, certainly, I think depending on, on the situation, there's also opportunities to put in incentives and help a student see that bigger picture. Um, and, and also taking it day by day. There might be days where you need to not fight that battle and, mm -hmm. and that's okay. But I think communication with the school is really important. It's also new for our schools. Mm -hmm. And I know they're trying to do the right thing and they're taking attendance and trying to do everything they know how to do to make mm -hmm. this a successful experience. But no child is going to be successful with the same supports. You know, we, we all have very different needs. So I think trying to communicate with the teacher and the school about the experience that is being had to see how they can also partner is, is really critically important. That's great advice. Yeah. I, and so, again, building going back to that relationship, I, I do think that that's the, the major factor that's contributing to this lack of motivation to engage and continue with on online classes is that teachers don't feel, I mean, students don't feel as connected to their teachers as they did in person. So mm -hmm. however, you know, the teacher is open to suggestion. 
um, maybe that will help. Um, Okay, well, thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated today. We love hearing from you and seeing where everyone's checking in from. Apparently Florida is a, a hot state uh, today <laughs> with, with this issue. So thank you for everyone who participated. If we didn't get a chance to address your questions, always know that we have Mom Squad. Um, you welcome, it's a private Facebook group. You're welcome to join. Um, it's open to any parents of kids or teens with learning and attention challenges. Um, and uh, like I said at the beginning of the show, and I'll say it again for anybody who logged on late, um, we are gonna be starting our peace group again and running it through Mom Squad. And peace is our support group for parents of children's, children and teens with learning and attention challenges. And it's really, it's a discussion. So um, we want you to be a part of that discussion. It's there to give you support, a little bit of education, um, but a lot of support right now. And so we'll be holding that virtually starting in January, 2021. So looking forward to that. Um, really quick, it looks like Ronke is just, just checking in, just saying great advice. I think being able to make connections first, first with classmates and importantly with teachers, very important. These connections, yes, it, they make children look forward to school and that's the Right. the piece that we're missing and it you know we we're learning we, we learned how valuable connection was in this this is what this time has taught us that connection is really valuable so you at fusion you know having the one-on-one -on -one school i'm sure you have that benefit that your teachers have immense connections really strong connections with their students we have that at the learning center that our students show up to their sessions because they love their clinicians so um it is it's all about connection so in saying that thank you audience for connecting with us and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you, Lauren. And one thing Lauren didn't say is that she is actually leading that peace group and she is amazing. So um, we'll keep you posted on when that's actually starting. Uh, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll here with our guest, Danny Rickman. We've been talking about five steps to empowering reluctant learners. Here's a recap. Relationship is key. Having a relationship with a mentor outside of the parent, if possible, can be really helpful. Two, look for those little wins and give specific praise. As your students feel more successful and hopeful, they're going to be more willing to engage. Three, build the skills needed to do the job. Four, help them let go of old coping strategies. And five, find a way to understand their world. Danny, what last thoughts do you have for our viewers today? I think most important as parents to your connection matters for you too. We need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to feel connected with our families and also outside. And luckily we do have platforms like this to be able to do it. There is hope, you're not alone. And we're all going through this together. So we need to lean on each other. And there's lots of fantastic people out there to be able to lean on. And if I can ever, be a support in any way to anyone out there with regards to navigating these crazy times. I would love to have a conversation. And Jill, thank you so much for having me on. I can't believe it's been an hour already. I know. <laughs> but it, it's been so much fun. And I, I really am grateful to everyone who's signed on and is listening and, and, and glad that you know, hopefully there's a village. There's a village out here for you and there's lots of support. Thank you, Danny, for sharing your insights and your encouragement and for all the work that you're doing at Fusion to empower students and parents. We're gonna put up Danny's contact information. If you would like to know more about Fusion Academy in Pasadena, you can contact her or visit their website. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Next Tuesday, Lauren and I will be talking about how retained reflexes impact behavior and learning. Frustrating or difficult behaviors and challenges with learning are related to something. They're not about not caring or not being motivated, bad parenting or being bad kids, but they could be related to retained reflexes. 
we will dig into what these are, how it might look, and what can be done. So be sure and join us next Tuesday at 10. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings. We're also seeing students on site with all of the COVID precautions. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to improve thinking and learning and build confident, independent learners. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Danny, and all of you who have been joining us live or on the replay. If you know of other parents who would benefit from this broadcast, please click that share button. Lauren and I will see you next week.